All right, it looks like most people are logged in here. So welcome to Understanding the Basics of Agricultural Finance. My name is Audrey Thompson. I'm a staff attorney here with the Penn State Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. Um, on our website at Penn State Ag Law, we have lots of resources available for all of our stakeholders uh, in rural communities and ag legal stakeholders where we provide a lot of content here. We write our agriculture law weekly review, our shale law weekly review. We also have our virtual resource rooms and issue trackers available on our website. We also produce audio and video content with our podcasts and our YouTube channel. And you probably registered for this event on our events page um, where you can find more events uh, upcoming events listed here. So you can also subscribe to all of this content on our website. So we encourage you to check out our website and subscribe to us if you are not already. Um, one last plug for the center. We also run the Pennsylvania Agricultural Mediation Program, which is funded through the USDA. This program has historically facilitate, facilitated mediations between ag producers and the USDA, but the authorization for it has been expanded over the last several years. And we can handle a lot uh, more topics and issues between parties. So please feel free to reach out to Jackie Schweikler, our program coordinator, with questions about ag mediation. Today's webinar on ag finance is part of the center's Understanding Ag Law series, a course of webinars designed to provide subject matter literacy and competence on fundamental issues of agricultural law to attorneys and business advisors who work with or represent agricultural or rural clients, but who may not necessarily specialize in agricultural law. This series is wholly sponsored by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's Ag Business Development Center, which was established through the 2019 Pennsylvania Farm Bill. The Agricultural Business Development Center aims to enhance the long-term vitality of Pennsylvania farms by supporting farm transitions, both from generation to generation and from conventional to organic farming, supporting beginning farmers, providing risk management education, and providing financial assistance through low interest loans and grants. This webinar on ag finance is the 10th webinar in the Understanding Agricultural Law Educational Series. Previous topics include ag labor, farmland leasing for energy development, land use regulation, legal protections or statutory protections, ag cooperatives, livestock market regulations, crop insurance, conservation programs, and licensing and regulation of direct ag product sales. Recordings of all of these webinars are available on YouTube, so if you missed it, you can check it out there. And next month on February 24th, we will present our uh, next uh, webinar in this series on Pennsylvania's Clean and Green Preferential Tax Assessment Program. Registration for that will be available soon. All right, I will turn this webinar over to Ross Pfeiffer. Ross is the clinical professor of law at Penn State Law, where he teaches property, oil and gas law, and agricultural law. Ross serves as the director for the Center of Agricultural and Shale Law and coordinates the Rural Economic Development Clinic at Penn State Law. Ross, the screen is yours. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Audrey. And so today we're going to talk about ag finance, and it's a, a very, a very broad topic. And so we're we're really going to be, um, you know, just uh, understanding the basics. So we're we're kind of um, scratching the surface of of a lot of these these topics. And and so we're going to focus on on three really three topics. I mean, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a background, and then we'll talk about about loans. Um, we'll talk about uh, about bankruptcy, Chapter 12 bankruptcy. We'll we'll talk about about agricultural liens. Um, you know, when you think of uh, when you think of ag finance, uh, you know, obviously taxation, transition planning are 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 huge. Um, we're not going to talk about those um, at all today. We're just going to talk about these three top bu bullet points, which I think you could probably lump all of those really into, um, I guess when I said lending, I'm really talking about kind of that, that front end of, of, uh, of loan making and, and loan servicing, really the security interest and bankruptcy, you could kind of lump those into, into, into that topic as well. Now, when we, um, you know, the idea of this, of this webinar series is, is really to focus on a lot of different topics. Um, as we have started this, this webinar series, we're, we're focusing on basics focusing on high level discussion of of these topics and as we move forward in this in this series our intention is to is to drill deeper um on on some of the topics and so you know you look at this this topic of of ag finance we could probably easily get six or seven kind of mid mid level or 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 deeper topics on 
you know, coming out of this of this introductory basic level presentation. And, and so if you are interested in a deeper dive in some of these topics, please, please let us know because we are um, responsive to or we want to be responsive to to the topics that that our audience is is interested in. So if you're interested in you know something that I talk about today and 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 then I really talk about at a very surface level, if you're interested in hearing more a, a, a discussion of that, please please let us know and we'll we'll try to to accommodate that. Okay. Okay, so just to kind of some starting points. I mean, and and, and some of this is going to be, you know, pretty pretty obvious to to you all, but but agriculture is a very capital intensive business. And when you when you look at at agricultural operations, often these these assets that a farm has, they've they've been accumulated over a long period of time. Um, could be a prior generation that uh, that that began um, accumulating the, these assets. And and when you look at the the need for capital, I mean those those assets that are uh, that a farm has are 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 not sufficient um, in many cases. So there's a there's a need for borrowing, and that that borrowing is needed both for a short term and a long term. So borrowing to buy uh, supplies and inputs. If, if you're talking about you know plant planting crops, you need you you may need a loan to 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 put that crop in the ground. Um, but also more long-term needs, buying, buying land, constructing facilities, buying, uh, buy, buying equipment. So I mean, those are points to keep in mind as we, uh, as as we're talking about about ag finance. If if you look at kind of how does ag finance fit into the you know overall agricultural picture, and you and you look at a a, a historic picture of of agriculture over time. Um, you know, it's interesting to think about the role of of capital and and finance in that. Um, Fry and Barons, who were um, an agricultural economist and a and a banker, in an article that they wrote um, in the early '80s, so quite quite a while ago, they they talked about three agricultural revolutions. The first revolution being a mechanical revolution in the early 1900s, where you had the <clears throat> the transition from from horse to tractor, so you so you had really the um, maybe not the beginning of mechanization, but the but 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 the dramatic increase of of mechanization, and as as or because of that, resulting from that, you had an increase in yields, but you also had an increase in costs. Um, tractors are more expensive than uh, than than horses. You move forward into the the 1950s and 60s, and in, in what's often referred to as the as the Green Revolution, uh, where you had technology became much more important, and the you know technology meaning the the use of inputs, uh, fertilizer, hybrid seeds, uh, pest control, irrigation, and so as a result of this this technology, once again yields increased, but so did so did costs. And then into in the 1980s, which is the the time when when Fry and Barons wrote this article, they 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 said that we were now or then in the the financial and management era, where where you're using business structures, uh, budgeting, accounting, taking advantage of, of of tax laws. You're using a greater use of 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 debt. And again, this is this is in the early 80s um, when when they when they wrote this, um, and and there was kind of a transition of farming which had been really a way of life and now it was it was a business model again you had increased efficiency of farms but the costs increased now since fry and barons wrote that i mean obviously a lot's happened in the last 40 years um i, I think you could look at this as as kind of an information the fourth revolution the information where now for farms to be successful they need to have timely information on on market prices uh, demand the prices of their input um, collecting data on on the farm using that data to, uh, uh, to 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 make decisions now when you look at the at at this information era again it should increase yields it increases the efficiency of business but it increased costs so when you when you kind of walk through those those three revolutions of Bar that Fry and Barron's talked about as well as as since then each one of those revolutions requires additional capitalization and and when you think about it on kind of a, a micro level on a on an individual 
farm, you know, when you transfer the farm from one generation to the next, you often need capital either to, to provide a retirement for the, the elder generation or perhaps to, to buy out some of the, uh, some of the siblings. So, so you need capital and kind of rolling that time back a bit. If you have, you know, maybe a, a, a younger generation is, is, is getting out of college or, or high school and wants to work on the farm. And so you may need to expand or diversify. So, so you need capital there too. Now, as, as you have, as you have, um, you know, more, as you need more capital, as you have more debt, I think you can kind of ask the question, does this make that, that operation more, more vulnerable to failure? And obviously, I mean, it's kind of a rhetorical question and in your jobs uh, in representing those, those clients is to try to try to protect them from, uh, from, uh, from that issue. Now, also just as, as kind of background, when you, when you talk about ag finance, a lot of things come back to the to the farm crisis of the 1980s. It really is somewhat similar to the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, which, when you look at national ag policy, it seems that you're that you always start when you're when you're talking about even policy today. When you start to look at at how that policy or how those those programs were started, it seems that they often go back to uh, the Great Depression and 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 the Dust Bowl. But when you when you look at kind of leading up to the to the uh, the farm crisis in the 1980s, you had ex a, a lot of government encouragement to increase production and increase borrowing. So you know people were told farmers were told to plant fence row to fence row to to uh, to get big through the 70s, and then at the end of the 70s, coming into the 80s, you had really the price price collapse. Um, in, in, in part based on the, the grain embargo to the uh, to the Soviet Union. And that had a tremendous impact on, on rural communities. It, it was an impetus and led to, to a, lot of, uh, a, lo a lot of political reforms to try to um, address the situation that was present at that time, as well as to try to, uh, to minimize or prevent a, a similar situation from uh, from happening in the future, and when you, when you look at some of the some of the economic data, um, you know, predating that that farm crisis of night of of the 1980s, and you look at assets and and debt, and um, this this is um, USDA e Economic Research Service data from from last month, and and these are in um, adjusted or inflation adjusted dollars, and you can see that peak. In the night in the 1980s, um, the yellow with is the real estate assets. The the blue is non real estate assets. But you see that peak and then the decline through the 1980s and in particular the early 80s. Then a leveling out and then really a con a, a constant growth both in in assets and debt uh, since since that time. Um, looking again at at ERS data from last month just looking at at debt to equity debt debt to assets you see again a peak in in uh, I guess it looks like it's about 1984 1985 you see a peak and then um uh, you know a, a dramatic decline but then you know even over time a, a fairly consistent decline until you know about what's that about seven eight years ago um start starting to have an increase over uh multi-year period, but over the last couple of years, then um, um, a, a decline again. So uh, so just some some historic data to maybe see where we are. Um, well, I guess to look at kind of what led to some of the law and policy that we have today, and then kind of looking at, at, at where we are now. Now, kind of on a maybe a lighter note with um, uh, coming out of the 1980s farm crisis, we had farm aid, um, which, which really started with an offhand remark by Bob Dylan um, when he was on the stage at Live Aid, which for those of you that remember, that was a kind of a mega concert, really one of the, you know, one of the earlier mega concerts um, that was designed to, uh, to raise money for African famine relief. And Bob Dylan stated that he hoped some of that money uh, could be used to pay for uh, mortgages in the US for farmers. And he took some criticism for his remarks, but then about six weeks after that, the first farm aid um, was started with Bob Dylan, John Mellencamp, and Neil, or, or um, 
I'm sorry, it was Willie Nelson, Neil Young, and John Mellencamp that kind of organized the first Farm Aid, and it's pretty much been happening just about every year since then. You see, Dave Matthews is now is now on the board as uh, as, as well. So again, that's kind of coming out of the uh, farm crisis of the 1980s. Now, when you look at at kind of a snapshot of uh, of of loan defaults and and look at how does agriculture compare to other other industries and i and i thought this was was you know very interesting agriculture is the green line and you can see uh what well, construction is yellow transportation is blue retail is uh is 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 purple general is kind of that um darker green and and what's red healthcare is red so you look at this and agriculture is consistently a percent or two lower than than other sectors in in their default rate. So from a from a lending perspective, agriculture lending to agriculture is is uh, is is pretty is pretty good business. You know why is this? I mean, you could think of factors as to why agriculture has a lower default rate. Um, you know the fact that you people are living there that's going to provide a little more incentive for people to figure out how to. Uh, to uh, to make the payments or to be a little bit more cautious when they're um, making making decisions about getting loan, I think some of the um, the multi generational impacts can, uh, can can be relevant as well. That 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 people are maybe I think about debt a little bit differently or think about walking away from debt a little bit differently when when their parents or grandparents um, you know worked on worked on that farm. But I think it's I think it's interesting just to see that the default rates are. Uh, pretty significantly lower, and that's been true, you know, fairly consistently when you look at kind of the nature of 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 this curve. Okay, so looking at uh, at, at farm capital, where where is farm capital coming from? So we have we have commercial banks, which are a significant source. Uh, you know, commercial banks and the farm credit system are really the 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 two dominant sources of of farm capital. You can see I've I've broken it down by um, uh, by real estate and non-real estate um, debt, that that commercial banks account for for 31% of the of the real estate debt and 47% of the non-real estate debt. Farm credit is um, is, is somewhat flipped, with 52% of the real estate, 35% of of the non-real estate. So those those two sources combined are you know about 82, 83 percent. Of, uh, of of farm debt, um, the farm service agency, which which we're gonna we're gonna talk about in in a, in a minute here, is a relatively small amount, only three percent, at least through the through the their direct loans, is a relatively small amount. But um, it, I think it's important because of the the nature of of who the farm service agency is is targeting. Also, the farm service agency has a um, guaranteed loans as well. So some of these, uh, some of the, the the commercial loans are going to, uh, or some of these numbers that are that are being reflected as commercial banks are also going to to have involvement with the, the farm service agency. The uh, the fourth bullet here, um, USDA lumped lumped these together, which I, I I wish they had had separated this out. The individuals and merchants, and the the merchants are are. I think what also is sometimes called captive finance, meaning um, if I buy a tractor from John Deere and John Deere loans me money, um, you know that now John Deere is my is my creditor. John Deere is the bank because they've they have loaned me the money. Um, you know, they're, John Deere is making their money probably through selling the tractor more so than extending the finance the finance is really a way for them to uh, to to encourage that that's the, or to to encourage me to purchase that product and you can see that from when we deal with non real estate um 16% it's a, a pretty significant number uh falls into that individuals and merchants i i would like to see that individuals and merchants kind of broken out um because i think they're you know individuals could be Family, friends, others that are that are loaning money. Um, I would think the, this kind of so-called cap to finance would probably be more so with the non-real estate. So you you have seven percent of the real estate debt is in this group. So maybe that maybe that tells us that this cap to finance is really about about ten percent. And then you have insurance companies, which still 
um, are a you know a, a, a fairly s- substantial source of capital for real estate debt. So people borrowing against their their life insurance uh, policy. I would think that that occurs less today than maybe it did in the past, but seven percent is still a pretty pretty significant uh, significant chunk of of capital. Okay, so if if we have it with commercial banks. When you aggregate the uh, the real estate debt and the non real estate debt, it 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 works out to thirty seven percent. So you know it's clear that commercial banks are are providing a lot of the capital, are capable of providing um, capital to agricultural operations. So why can't we rely more on commercial banks? You know we look at at farm credit system and the the farm service agency as you know governmental involvement in in, in lending to uh, to agricultural operations. And really the reason for, um, you know, as a policy reason for us to not rely on, on commercial banks, you know, it goes back over a over hundred years back to the establishment of the, of the farm credit system in, in 1916. And it was established because there was a thought at that time, and I think that that thought would hold true today, is that there aren't uh, there aren't sufficient lending options in all rural areas. So you know there might be a bank that's servicing a rural area, but if it's only one bank, then you know there, it can it can lead to all of the issues that uh, that result when you just have one service provider. Maybe there are no uh, service providers in in a rural area. So by 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 establishing the farm credit system, you know Congress was acting to make sure that there were sufficient lending options everywhere in the, you know in all of the rural areas in in the country. So these these the farm credit system is a it's a network of cooperatives, and you know a cooperative is a essentially a business model where the 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 people who use the cooperative are the owners of that cooperative. So, you know, applying that cooperative principle to to lending money, you have agricultural operations that are that become members of a cooperative, then borrow money from that cooperative. And that cooperative exists, you know, in the case of of a a farm credit system cooperative, the cooperative exists for the purpose of 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 uh, providing a service to the farmers, that service being le- lending money. So you have this network of cooperatives throughout the country. <clears throat> it's important to, to recognize that they are not part of USDA. So even though they are uh, chartered by the US government, even though they are providing service to, to the agricultural community, they are not part of USDA. And these these farm credit um, these these farm credit lenders they compete with commercial banks. So if a farmer wants to uh, to look at a loan, they may contact a local bank um, to to see um, or multiple banks to see what the terms are, and they also may co- may contact their the farm credit um, cooperative in their area to look at uh, to look at their options as well. Because these farm credit system cooperatives are authorized by federal government, they can only engage in activities that are consistent with their with their statutory authorization, and and that is limited. So you, know, you can't open up a bank account and um, you know a checking account or or um, as it, with a farm credit cooperative as you could with it with a commercial bank. So farm credit. Uh, lenders they compete with commercial banks in some respects, but then there are areas where where they they're outside their statutory authority, so they they can't engage in those in those activities. And you know, from time to time, the the extent of the authority that the farm credit system has is is a, a topic for for debate at the at the national level. Um, you know, advocates for there are advocates who are looking to extend or expand the farm credit systems authority and um you know and then there are then there are are others who are looking to 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 not expand that or even restrict it from from what exists today 
Um, generally speaking, farm farm credit system can't lend for rural housing or rural or rural for rural housing or or rural businesses, you know, non-agricultural businesses. But again, this is sometimes up for for policy debate as to whether whether this sh this should be extended and it's always it's always hotly debated and it's always a an issue normally where commercial lenders commercial banks are pushing back on on um, having the farm credit service authority extended because they feel that there are already enough advantages that uh, that are that are possessed uh, by them and then the farm advocates for the farm credit system are are arguing that you know in order for them to accomplish their statutory mission they they need to have or it would be beneficial to have an expansion of of this authority okay so i, I mentioned that it was a a network um here's a map kind of illustrating this this network um you'll see here in pennsylvania now we have a nice uh clean state in that the entire state is served by by one farm credit uh um organization, uh, Horizon, and Horizon was established last year as a result of a merger between um, Ag Choice Farm Credit and Admit Atlantic Farm Credit. Ag Choice previously had um, the majority of Pennsylvania, but Mid Atlantic had the uh, the south, south central, southeastern portions of Pennsylvania. But you can see now all of Pennsylvania, uh, all of Delaware, uh, most of Maryland and, and then a, a bits of West Virginia and Virginia are part of uh, Horizon Farm Credit. Okay, Farm Service Agency. This is an agency within USDA, so part of USDA. And historically, it has been referred to as a lender of last resort, meaning if you can't get credit anywhere else, you come to the Farm Service Agency for, for credit. Now, several years ago, they, they, they tried to kind of flip this perception and saying, we're not the lender of last resort, we're the lender of first opportunity. So, you know, for those, you know, of course, who needs the first opportunity, those people who can't get, who can't get loans um, or have trouble getting loans elsewhere. But it, it certainly kind of paints a different picture of, of who the Farm Service Agency is trying to uh, service in there. And, and they do have a, uh, a targeted area of, of uh, people who are beginning or people who historically have not been able to get, have not had the opportunities uh, for, for commercial funding. So their mission is to provide credit when it's not available elsewhere. Um, there is a graduation requirement, meaning that if you have to demonstrate in getting a loan from the Farm Service Agency, you have to demonstrate that you, that you can't get lending elsewhere. And then at some point in the future, if you have progressed such that you can get lending elsewhere, you need to get lending elsewhere. So, so you at that point, you would graduate from the Farm Service Agency loan program into something else. So, you know, it's helping people get started, helping to give them that first opportunity. But when they're able to move on, then then they need to move on. Now, the the Farm Service Agency, I mean, it, it's a very unique structure organizationally. Um, I, I don't know if it's the only federal agency, but it's one of the few federal agency that actually has kind of a grassroots organization in that you have state offices, you have county committees, and these county committees are basically farmers that are elected by other farmers in that in that county to serve on the on the um, the farmer farm service agency's county committee. Historically, these county committees had a pretty large role in the loan programs, and that's not true today, but historically they did. And you know there were some instances of um, of, of discriminatory lending, um, which I I think trace back to to that the nature of that organizational structure. And so USDA still has county committees. But the roles of the county committees are are somewhat different, and so when you look at how loans are made, it, it's basically being made through the you know, I mean, people are still applying at the county office. Um, decisions are made by you know the state office, the the more traditional government employees rather than rather than the county committees. Okay, the Farm Service Agency gives direct loans where you know U.S. money is paid out. 
to farmers. Farmers are making their loan payments to the U.S. government. They also have guaranteed loans where, where a farm service agency um, will provide a guarantee to a commercial lender for a, a specific uh, percentage of the of the loan amount. So it's a way to incentivize these private lenders for uh, incentivize them to give the the loans um, to to the farmers. Farm service agency loans can be there's a variety of purposes from ownership, so buying property, so really looking at that long term, the long term capital needs, as well as the operating loans, meaning those normally the annual. Uh, capital needs in order to get to get a crop in the ground or to to conduct business on 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 an annual basis, and then there also are emergency loans. So so more you know shorter term um, you know less less foreseeable situations uh, a loan can be uh, can can be provided um, to be eligible for the farm surface agency loans. You have to meet a a kind of a size requirement. Um, you know, obviously, when you talk about what's a what's a family farm, that's a a, a difficult, um, you know, difficult to define what that is. But but there are um, you know requirements, kind of size requirements, uh, for applying for FSA loans. You have to have a satisfactory cr credit history, and you have to have either training or experience. So even though FSA is targeting um, the the beginning farmers. They still have to have worked on a farm or undergone some training, and it is supervised credit. So, so FSA is involved as the you know as money is needed, even though the loan's been approved. As as the farmers looking to draw on that credit, they they have to get permission to do that. I mentioned the graduation requirement, and and there are targets um, or priorities. Uh, certain um, groups or classifications of uh, of farmers receive priority for these loans. Now, I think one of the, the best part about FSA loans are the servicing options. So if, if a farmer is having difficulty making payments, um, when they um, are in default, um, 90 days after that point, they will receive a notice of the servicing options and they have 60 days to apply for, for the servicing. So if you're representing a client, and they get this this notice of servicing options. They really need to jump on that, because you can have the loan entirely rewritten, you know, reamortized, rescheduled. You can defer it. You can you can have a lower interest rate. Debt can be written down. Um, you can um, agree to a debt for nature contract where you agree to impose a conservation easement in exchange for for writing off debt. Um, in in analyzing whether the the servicing option or what servicing option is going to be um, authorized, um, you the farmer has to have a feasible plan. So they have to be able to cash flow moving forward. And USDA will use this uh, dollars uh, debt and loan restructuring system in order to determine you know are is this farmer going to be able to cash flow if they don't have you know, is it going to cash flow? And is USDA, if they foreclose, they calculate how much they would receive, and then they need to make sure that they're going to at least receive that amount. Um, if there's not a feasible plan, mediation is available to, to, you know, to try to work something out. The farmer has the opportunity to buy the the property at market value, and even if if um if foreclosure takes place and and FSA takes this property back into inventory. There's the the potential to lease that for the farmer to lease that with with the option to purchase. And you know these servicing options have been greatly expanded since the 1980s farm crisis. And there was um, Block v. Curry class action litigation kind of raised a number of issues. And USDA um, you know made made changes in terms of programs that how the programs were implemented and what was offered. But moving on to security interests. Um, you know, this is a this is an area for state largely for for state law, and states have adopted the Uniform Commercial Code. Article nine is um, is where the secured transactions are are addressed. And when you when you look at kind of you know agriculture in in Article nine, there are a number of uh, of of provisions that are specifically dealing with agriculture. So you know, I've I've highlighted some of them here and on the next on the next screen, but you know, dealing with perfection, priority, 
um, you know, you need to kind of look at look at these ag specific provisions in the in the UCC. Okay, so um, you know, kind of very basically with 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 secured transactions, you know, you have the security interest, which is the the, the property interest that the that the secured creditor holds to the to the uh, the property that's owned by the the debtor. The security agreement is that. Um, you know that that document or or the agreement between that the creditor and the debtor, and then the collateral is you know the thing that the that the debtor owns, like a tractor, that the that the bank has a has a security interest in, and you know obviously very generally the 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 overview of that process you have you have attachment you have. Um, you know, certain requirements where there's value that's provided by the secured party, there are rights in the collateral that are that are held by the debtor and you have an agreement. So when you have this this attachment requirement as satisfied, you have a, a relationship between the, the debtor and the creditor um, and, and, and such that the, the creditor can repossess that uh, that collateral if payment is not made. Now, when we move on to perfection, you know, attachment is focused on the relationship between that debtor and the creditor. When we move on to perfection, we're dealing with the relationship of the of the creditor, the secured creditor, to the whole world, and how are secured creditors? How do they relate to uh, to to one another? And and perfection can be accomplished by you know, norm it can be accomplished by possession, but obviously that's a, that's you know doesn't always work. Um, if um, you know if if you have a security interest, if a creditor has a security interest in a tractor, well, they can't really retain possession of that tractor because the farmer needs to use that. So the way that perfection is most commonly accomplished is by filing a a, a financing statement, and um, you know financing statements are are filed with the state. Um, Five-year term. I think the filing fee in Pennsylvania is still is still eighty-four dollars to uh, to file that. They can be modified by 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 filing uh, the the uh, another UCC three. And you know, if if you've worked in this area, you know that there's ex extreme precision is required because just a small mistake can uh, can can have a, a a huge impact in filing that financing statement. Now, when we look at some some ag specific provisions, you know, three areas that I that, that I at least want to mention today: uh, farm products, and, and we'll talk a, a little bit more about that in detail in just a, a minute or two here. But also purchase purchase money security interests, and purchase money security interests are you know essentially a super priority that is provided to someone who is lending money to purchase a specific thing. So, you know, even though there may be, um, you know, that that thing may be collateral to another debtor with a purchase money security interest, the person that's lending money now may may get a um, may get a, a, a kind of a super priority. And, and with regard to, uh, to to ag livestock, um, you know, this is I say new um, in the revised article, um, article nine. Um, saying meaning new is anything that's happened since I graduated from law school. Um, but it, it was, you know, going back to, to I think, 2001, um, when the revised Article 9 was, was, um, was, was promulgated and enacted by, by states, there was a PMSI for, for livestock that was, um, that was included in there. And so I think that's something you need to be aware of. There are notice requirements but it is it is available and on the flip side the pmsi for for crops was uh, that did exist was was eliminated um statutory agricultural liens we'll we'll touch on that uh briefly briefly um at the, at the in a few minutes here as well okay so let's let's talk about the um the the farm products rule and this is the general the general statement. So we're not we're not to the federal farm products rule yet, but we're providing the background for that. And in in um, 315A, basically states that if there is a security interest, it continues even if that property is sold. So if if um, 
if if there's a, if the tractor is collateral or crops are collateral for for uh, for, for that there's a security interest, so the creditor has a security interest in that, and that property is transferred, that security interest stays. So you know you the the, the purchase the person or entity that acquired that property is going to have to you know they paid the the farmer for that product and since the lien continues they're going to have to pay the creditor for that for that lien or to satisfy that lien so it 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 leads to the potential for for double payment where someone purchasing something has to pay for that thing and then they have to pay the 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 creditor to extinguish the uh the security interest that exists so the thought was we don't want to have we want to remove that that possibility of of double payment so we're going to eliminate it for the so-called buyer in the ordinary course of business so if someone is considered to be a buyer in the ordinary course of business they will purchase that that item free of the security interest even if even if it you know even if the lender did everything properly and the buyer knows that it's there when the buyer in the ordinary of course of business buys that the security interest is is wiped away so it removes that that ability or the the possibility of of double payment but you will see here in italics there is i guess you would say an exception to the exception that if a person is buying farm products from a person engaged in, in farming operations, then this rule doesn't doesn't um, you know it doesn't uh, address it. Meaning, if someone is buying a farm product, they still have that possibility of double payment. They still have the possibility of paying for the farm product and then being liable to pay the the uh, the person who holds a security interest on those farm products. Okay, so that happened, you know, as a result of this, states were handling it differently. There was a thought at the federal level that this need to, needed to be uniform, it needed to be it needed to be clarified, and so Congress passed the the Federal Farm Products Rule. And and so it 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 basically um you know, it addresses that relationship between the person that's buying a farm product and the secured creditor that holds a security interest on that. It doesn't affect the attachment perfection, doesn't affect the relationship between the debtor and the secured creditor, doesn't affect the, the, uh, the, um, the priority between secured creditors. It's just between the buyer of that farm product and the secured creditor. Okay, so and I'll get to the language here and I think on the next slide, but so the, the ultimate outcome of, of this is that it allows the, the buyers of farm products can purchase these products and they, they, they don't have to worry about this possibility of double payment where they're going to have to pay the person who holds a, uh, has a security interest on that. However, it does provide a mechanism where secured creditors can retain that lien through through notification. And so just to just to look at the language, the kind of the critical language of of the rule and you'll you know see that a, a buyer in the ordinary course of business who buys a farm product from a, a seller engaged in farming operations takes free of that security interest even though it's perfected, even though the buyer knows. So if I just if I go back to the UCC, you know, you'll you'll see the language is is pretty much identical um, to to what applied to every you know what the the standard that applied to everyone else where the buyers of farm products were accepted. Well, now as a result of the federal farm products rule, you basically are are bringing farm the buyers of farm products into that general rule. Okay, so the notice. The options are either a direct notice or central filing. Pennsylvania is a, is a direct notice state along with the majority of other states. So this means that the secured party has to provide notice to buyers within one year of the sale, and the notice has to have specific information. Now, you might ask, well, how does the secured 
creditor know who to send the notices to? Well, they need to send the notices to anyone that might be a buyer of farm products from that from that particular creditor. Now, on the surface, it seems like that's um, uh, maybe a um, you know fairly burdensome to do that. But you know, if you if you think a little bit more deeply about it, on a particular farm, there there probably are a relatively limited subset of people who are going to be buying farm products, you know, based upon what's being produced on that farm. And so a creditor, a secured creditor, has to have a system in place where every year they're sending these note, they're sending these notices. And um, you know, and if, if so, if you're representing a creditor, you need to make sure that those those notices, if you're representing a buyer of farm products, you need to make sure that, you know, if they get one of these notices, which are going to look just like a, you know, a boilerplate notice that, you know, they may wonder, why am I even getting this? Well, it, it's putting them on notice that that if they happen within the next year to buy something from that uh, from from that farm, that they're going to they are potentially looking at double payment because if they buy something from that farm and they don't settle the the security interest then they're going to be responsible for for paying that that secured creditor okay agricultural liens um you know i'm directing you to a resource here that's on the national ag law center's site and they have compiled all of the agricultural liens for Pennsylvania, as well as all of the other states, and you know it's a it's a it's a great resource. This is just looking at a couple liens. So you have you know the the, the mechanical mechanics lien, which many of you are familiar with, as well as a landlord's lien, and it it just gives you information about you know how that you know what's required um, in order for that uh, for, for for that lien to uh, to, to have an impact. Um, if I can't, I'm going to try to, let's see how much time for, yes, I'm going to try to go to the website to show you, um, a little bit more about, um, about this, uh, this, this resource. So the, the resource, you know, here's, I'm on the National Ag Law Center's website. They've updated this within the last couple of years, like 2021. So they'd updated it a year or two ago. And you can see, you know, it has every state. You hover over Pennsylvania. You can click on it if you want to know what Maryland does. You can hover over that and and look at it. And then here is the resource from Pennsylvania. So, you know, you can see they have a, a you know, it's a quite a variety of of uh, of agricultural liens from you know ranging from uh, you know lien on spinners, throwsters, and and dyers to a lien on cruelly transported animals. Um, um, you know, lean for violating seasonal farm labor. So, you know, these, I, this is, I think, a handy chart to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to reference um, the, the liens that, that exist in, in Pennsylvania. Okay, now, um, okay, time check, we have 10 minutes. So we um, talk about bankruptcy here. Okay, so here are the, you know, four kind of common chapters, and really each of these four chapters can apply to uh, to family farmers, the basic seven liquidation, business reorganization in 11, a, a, an individual reorganization in 13, and then and then chapter 12, which is really specially designed for farmers. But again, farmers could file those others. Um, so chapter 12 was created in 1986. So again, as a response to the to the farm crisis of the early 80s, and it was um, it it was created because of the thought that the that the other chapters really didn't address farm bankruptcies. Now, why didn't they address farm bankruptcies? Because chapter 11 is too complex. Chapter chapter 11 is dealing with businesses ha, has much more than than what most farms need, but chapter 13 is for individuals and so the the threat the the um the debt threshold is is lower and it also requires a, a regular income which you know farms don't always have if you're raising crops you know you only get paid once a year or you only get paid you know when you're selling selling crops which may not be on a, on a, at a regular time period so so 11 and 13 really didn't work for for all farms so so uh chapter 12 was enacted in in 86 but it had a sunset of 1993 and then it just was it, it kept getting extended. It was extended 11 times. There were times where 
where chapter 12 was not available because each of these extensions you know didn't always occur right at the time that the uh, that that chapter 12 was sunsetting so in 2005 again I'll say it was recently because it happened since I've graduated law school but in 2005 it chapter 12 was was made permanent uh, was made permanent okay so who is eligible um, it is a family farmer with regular annual income. So it addressed kind of that irregular income in a, in a traditional sense by, by having this on, that there was annual, it was regular annual income. And the in 2005, when it was made permanent, family fishermen were also added. So to be eligible, you can either be an individual or individual and spouse or a corporation or partnership. For an individual, um, it have to be act, you have to be engaged. There's a um, um, a threshold, eleven million dollars less for fishermen, and the debt, at least half of the debt, has to be related to the operation. Also, at least half of the income has to come from the operation. And for farmers, you know, you can look back two or three years to uh, to to meet this requirement. Now, for corporations or it, you know, somewhat similar, um, but it, it has to be a family corporation. So you have to have at least 50% or excuse me, more than 50% of the stock or equity owned by one family. It can't be publicly traded. Um, you see kind of the, the same 80% requirement related to the operation, same debt th threshold, um, and at least 50% um, 50 of, the, of the debt um, related to that operation as, as well. The, uh, the process I'm going to zip through these last slides pretty quickly because the you know the process is pretty similar to um, you know to to other chapters or 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 to a thirteen you know where you you file you file the position petition pay the fee um, get whatever requirements credit counseling requirements there's a trustee appointed and with the twelve you're kind of borrowing the concepts from an eleven and a thirteen so you borrow that concept of the trustee collecting payments. But you also have that that uh, the concept of a debtor in possession, where you know this is a farm that's gonna it's a reorganization, so the farm's gonna continue to operate, and and, and the the farmer needs to have the ability to just to, to to make to do certain things that any business that's in that's that's in continuing operations needs to uh, needs to do. Um, you have the meeting of creditors. You have the uh, the plan that's filed. It's three to five years. Creditors can can uh, can object, but they don't vote. If the plan is is confirmed or not by the uh, by by the court, um, you know the plan. I think pretty much similar to to a thirteen. And then if all the payments are made in the plan, the uh, the bankruptcy is discharged. If the debtor doesn't comply with it, then then it uh, the bankruptcy can can be dismissed. And so when you look at as um, data from Chapter 12 bankruptcies over the last decade, you know, you see kind of a, a kind of a rise, but then peaking in 2000 in 2019, and then really a pretty dramatic drop from uh, from 2020 to uh, to 2021, and uh, you know maybe there's some other factors um, at, at play there, but um, this just gives you an idea of how prevalent. Chapter 12 bankruptcies are by by region and where's the mid-Atlantic. So there were, was that what, 23, 23 chapter 12s in the mid-Atlantic region in 2021. So um, with that, um, I guess I'll take any questions that anyone has. I think we have about five minutes left. We do have a couple of questions here, Russ. Um, so first of all, thank you. Um, the first one is from John Agner. And so this is uh, dealing with the kind of the finance portion, the front part of your presentation here. He says, I'm on the board of a federal credit union, a cooperative in essence, and we are regulated by a federal agency. Who regulates farm credit lenders and can they affiliate with a credit union? Well, I mean, farm credit lenders, I mean, they're, they're, you have individual cooperatives and then they are organized within, within specific regions in, in the country. And then there is a central um, kind of a, a, a national farm farm credit organization that um, that that has some oversight. Um, you know, I, I suppose there there's there's congressional oversight at 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 some level as well. Um, can they affiliate with a credit union? 
Um, you know, they are a cooperative. I mean, you, you'd have to look at, I mean, they're a cooperative. So, you know, they have to act in a way that's going to benefit their, the members of, of the cooperative. Um, so I would, I guess I would look at that issue and I would look at the statutory authorization. You know, is there a, um, you know, is, is there a prohibition um, on, on kind of an affiliation? And I guess maybe the third question is what, what's the extent of the, of the affiliation? You know, are you looking to kind of integrate business operations or are you looking to, to maybe work together on a, on a more narrow, more narrow scale? Okay, great. And then we have another question on the Farm Products Act. So this is about where the um, the notice of the, the lien can be tendered to the buyer within one one year after the sale. And uh, John Agner writes, how does that prevent the buyer from experiencing double payment if they dispose of the product, making them liable to the lien holder, and they've already paid the purchase price to the seller? Well, if if they fall within that federal farm products rule, then the lien, the lien is extinguished. Okay. So, you know, it, it, the, the creditor can provide notice, which then pr provides that the creditor or that the lien will not be extinguished. But if the, if the notice, if, if you're in a notice state, if the notice was not provided, then the, well, if, excuse me, if the notice was provided, then the lien will continue and there is the possibility of double payment. If the lien was, if the notice was not provided, then, then that lien is extinguished. And so there is no double payment. Great. Then we have another question from uh, A Flag. And I think this person is talking about FSA loans because that's going to have county offices. Correct me if I'm wrong. And this person writes, so if you move to a new county and they have county committees and they don't know you and they don't like you, can they deny you? Yeah. And that's where there have been a lot of changes in the composition and the, the, the roles of those county committees. And so today, the county committees, I mean, the, the decision making is done at the at the state level or is done by the the full-time FSA employees, not by the county committees. Historically, the county committees could deny loans, and that caused a number of problems with um, with you know the, the bases for which those denials were made. And right, so FSA right. or USDA has tried to address those those concerns, which led to a lot of litigation, a lot of um, a lot of payments. Uh, they've tried to address that by um, by by kind of restricting some of the authority that um, that those county committees had. We have one we have one last question from John Agner, and he <clears> writes: <throat> um, So, do family farms either use seven or eleven, depending on their formation status, for liquidation? I'm not. I think so. He means Chapter Seven or Chapter yeah, Eleven. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, eleven is a is a business reorganization. So you know a, a farm can use an a farm can use a seven. It's just that's just a simple liquidation. Um, but if they're looking to 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 reorganize, um, you know, an individual, you you have um, you you have the thirteen. Um, but but the farms could use any of these chapters. But there are, um, you know, some of them don't fit um, don't fit them. But you know, an eleven is is I mean, a seven is pretty simple. An eleven is is can be pretty complicated, and it often more complicated than what a farm would want. Okay, um, I think that's all we have. So we're at one hundred one. Thank you so much for joining us today for understanding agricultural finance. Please join us again next month on uh, Friday, February twenty fourth, for understanding the basics of Pennsylvania's clean and green preferential tax assessment program. If you have questions about CLE, please email us, and uh, we'll hope to see you next month. Thanks, everyone.